It's very nice uh, to be part of the Adventist Today Sabbath seminar at the beginning of the new year. And it's a real privilege to be uh, part of uh, Adventist Today on a regular basis. Thank you, uh, Lauren, for inviting me to do. Um, it's our privilege to have you. Thank you so much for being willing to do it. Our Father in Heaven. Well, when you introduced me and said that I would be uh, giving a presentation on the Lord's Prayer, the first thing I have to do is to disappoint you because it's only going to be on this first sentence of the Lord's Prayer. Okay. Our Father in Heaven. And I should say that... Uh, I do not feel that I am any kind of an expert on the New Testament. And maybe there are people in the uh, audience on this meeting who, uh, who know more about the New Testament, uh, much, a lot more than I do. But uh, I wrote a sermon on this topic not too long ago. And then I thought, well, maybe I can also rework that into a presentation for um, uh, our uh, seminar. And uh, there are undoubtedly uh, people in the audience who can add to what I have been saying or uh, highlight features that I may not have included. So our Father in heaven, we know the text of the Lord's Prayer, Our Father in Heaven. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debt, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And let us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is from the NIV, the New International Version. And as you see, the last sentence is between square brackets because uh, in uh, many of the manuscripts of the uh, New Testament, uh, this verse is not in, this line is not included. So it is doubtful whether it was part of the original prayer that Jesus taught the disciples. But anywhere, I like to have it because I think it is a glorious and a beautiful ending of this majestic prayer. Now, we have uh, two versions of the Lord's Prayer. We have a version in Matthew, Matthew 6 and one in Luke 11. The version in Luke is somewhat shorter, and it seems to be one of the rules in uh, New Testament uh, textual history that if you have a shorter version, the likelihood is that that is the most original. Uh, in Matthew, the Lord's Prayer is embedded in the Sermon on the Mount. In uh, Luke, it is rather a Sermon on the Plain. And it is in response to the request of the disciples to teach them how to pray. Teachers, it seems, were accustomed to uh, uh, give a specific prayer to their disciples. Uh, they might have been formulas of blessings or more extended prayers. And we have a reverence to the fact that John the Baptist seems to have taught a prayer to his group of followers as well. Teach us as John taught his disciples, the disciples said. Well, which version shall we follow? Which one is the most reliable one is the most original one. And uh, 
I'm sure that uh, most of you are willing to accept that uh, the uh, Gospels just are different uh, reminiscences of different people. And so people remembered different things in a different way. And uh, we do not have to be obsessive about trying to reconcile everything in these uh, Gospels. Moreover, Jesus may have given this prayer at more than one occasion, and thus he may have given himself variations. When we look at uh, the uh, documents from the early centuries, we see that the Lord's Prayer was cited by many authors in those early centuries. And for instance, we find that more or less verbatim in the Didache, an important document teaching, it is called, uh, that dates from about 120 AD. That it was a very special prayer is apparent, for instance, from one very interesting source, the catechesis of Cyril of Jerusalem, a church leader in Jerusalem in the mid fourth century. And we see that the Lord's Prayer there had an important role in the preparations for baptism of uh, baptismal candidates and was part of the liturgy around the baptism uh, that took place uh, there in Jerusalem at Easter time. There were many preparations uh, before the actual baptism, fasting, prayers by the congregation, the believers. There were exorcisms and various other rites and then the climax came on the Saturday before Easter Sunday as the candidates confessed their faith before the uh, assembled church. Then on Easter Sunday morning, or rather sometimes in the night, uh, the baptismal candidates were baptized by triple immersion. That was the practice there in Jerusalem at that time, and then anointed. They would then participate for the first time in the Lord's Supper. And the prayer after the Eucharist, after the Lord's Supper, would end with the Lord's Prayer, indicating that now the newly baptized were fully children of God, and they were entitled to address God as their father. How do we actually address God? Before we answer that question or go into that question, I would like to ask the question, how do we address people? Now, in the English language, it is rather clear you use the word you, and using the word thou or thine, etc., is old-fashioned, and you don't do that anymore, at least. Uh, in other languages, that is not quite as obvious. There's also a difference between the United States and many parts of the world. There used to be, at least, in the question, who do we call by their first name? For many of us in Europe, in past times, it was somewhat funny to hear the use of the first name at almost every occasion in the United States. People would be called by their first name. Whereas in many European countries, that was not the case. That certainly was not the case in the Netherlands. When, uh, uh, Afya and I left the Netherlands in 1984 to go as what we called missionaries to go to West Africa. At that time, leaving the Netherlands, we would always be called by our last name. I was not Reinder. I was Brother Brownsma or Pastor Brownsma, but 
calling me by my first name, except by close friends, was not done. Things changed quite uh, suddenly. Uh, when we returned to the Netherlands about 17, 18 years later, well, we had been on some vacations, of course, but settled again in the Netherlands, I was surprised that now almost everybody called me by my first name. And no longer would I be introduced as a rule in the service as today Pastor Brancho will be speaking to us, but very often just Reinder will be speaking to us. It was something to get used to. At first, I didn't always like it, but there has been a very quick transition, and I'm not quite sure what uh, caused it from not using the first name to using the first name. Something similar also happened with regard to the use of titles. Now, in some countries, and uh, you, Lauren, who have German blood, you know that in Germany, the title would always be used uh, very precisely. You would be Herr Doctor, and uh, the lady in the, of the house would be Frau Doctor. Uh, we uh, never had that very much in the Netherlands that we would be called Doctor or whatever title we would have. Uh, and uh, nowadays it's rare to be addressed like that. Even people may be aware of the fact that you have an academic degree. But how we address people is very much dependent on the country we live in, the culture we have. And there are occasions when the address is formal and there are occasions when the address is more informal. But for instance, in German, you still have a major difference to between a formal and informal way of addressing people. You either say do when it's a close friend or somebody that you are, uh, uh, that, that is a relative, not a, uh, not a uh, formal uh, person, uh, because then you would use the word see. And that is the same in French, where it is to for the informal, and fu for the formal way of addressing people. Now, interestingly, both in the German and in the French language, when addressing God, it is the informal form that is being used. In Germany, du, uh, in French, tu. Now, we have something uh, a bit funny in Flemish and Dutch, uh, Flemish is a form of Dutch that is spoken in Belgium, where you have the very formal gij, uh, rather than you, gij. Uh, but uh, in Flemish, that tends to be informal. In Dutch, that is very formal. So how do we address a person? It depends uh, a lot on where we are and what the culture is. But that leads me to the question, how should we address God? So in German, we have the uh, informal du. In French, we have the informal tu. Uh, in, uh, in English, you really don't have the problem because you have you. Uh, in the Dutch language, we very much have a problem because there is the informal jij or the formal u. Uh, how we address God is an issue that Bible translators have to deal with. In the past, of course, in English translations, you had the you or the thou, yours, and thine, etc. Uh, that has more or less solved it as language developed and the more formal, old-fashioned uh, forms have disappeared from more recent Bible translations. Uh, the word Lord. Now, for you in the English-speaking world, there is no problem. But in Dutch, there are two ways of writing that word. Heer or Heere. 
And you can immediately see when you see the word here that you are dealing with a more progressive kind of Christianity, whereas when you see the word here spelled with first double E and then one E at the end, you can see that uh, that is in a very conservative, orthodox kind of setting. How do we address God? Yahweh, Jehovah. Of course, there is a particular group of people who uh, thinks that we have to address God as Jehovah, or do we use other terms like the one, etc., etc. But here, uh, today, we are focusing in particular on addressing God as Father. And I have put a question mark there. Is that how we can properly address God? If so, what does it mean? When we speak about God, then we must keep in mind that speaking about God is always a particular kind of speaking. It is using metaphors. It is using images, symbols. Speaking about God, for us human beings, is complicated. We have to use analogy. Human words get a special meaning uh, when they are dealing with God. But whatever words we use, they always fail to do justice to God and to who and what he is. Just words that we use routinely have a different meaning, uh, not a precise meaning, when they are applied to God. Almighty, what do we mean by using that word when we ourselves are so limited in what we can do, in our power, in what we are? Eternal. What do we mean by eternal? We who are uh, just here for a short moment. Omniscient, omnipresent, all these words, we use them to, to try to say something about God. But we simply have no better word, so that's the best we can do. But we know that is not really a precise way of describing God. God is more than these words imply. Language of faith always makes use of metaphors. Jesus, in his parables, that is, of course, a sublime uh, uh, example of how Jesus would use common words to as analogies for divine things, for things that were way above our understanding in our world. God is uh, spoken of as a rock, just to take an example. Of course, he is not a rock in the literal sense, but by saying, by, by describing God as a rock, we, we do get a sense uh, of the solidity of, of the, 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 uh, uh, the fact that God is who he is. God as a shepherd. Of course, God is not a shepherd in the literal sense, but that word gives us some kind of sense, some kind of idea of the, uh, the, the care that God has for us. And then there is, in the language of faith, the idea that God is our Father. Now, that raises immediately the question whether if he is our father, whether God can be spoken of as being male. Well, it's difficult because in the image of God, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Male and female apparently are both in the image of God. To say that God is our father immediately raises this question. Then, 
is he male, but also more than that, because we are created in his image, male and female. What we can say is that God is, of course, not our father in any biological sense, not in any uh, sense as we usually use the word father. Uh, and that is also true that when we speak of God as the father of Jesus Christ, that is also not a word used in a biological sense. John 4, verse 24 says that, anyway, God is spirit. Rather, it's difficult to reconcile the word father with the fact that God is spirit. We say, nor uh, usually, and uh, a theological expression that God is a person. But what can that mean to speak of God as a person? Well, if we go into the history of uh, Christianity, we find that the word person was introduced in theological language in the early centuries when Greek was replaced by Latin and when the Greek word prosopon was replaced by the Latin word persona, which actually in its literal sense was a mask. So that is how that word got into the theological language, God as a persona. Uh, what does it mean? Well, uh, we think that when we talk about beings around us that uh, they must have personality in order to qualify as a being. And so God must somehow have personality. He is at least that. He is at least what we are, but more than that. So really, uh, when we speak of God as a person, that is a very poor way of describing God. God is much more than that, but we have no other term to really describe God. Justin Welby, uh, leader of the uh, Anglican Church, said a few years ago, we cannot confine God to a definition. God is neither male nor female. We do not do him justice when we apply such terms to him. So I think that is important to underline, that whatever words we use to describe God, and if we are going to talk about God as a father, we can never do him full justice by applying these words, but we have no other words. So uh, we must make them as meaningful as we can. Many of you may have read the book, The Shack. Shack was written by a American author, Paul Young. And it's about a person called Mac who uh, suffers a tragedy in his life. His little daughter was abducted and then was found murder, murdered uh, later in a shack. And Mac has a very hard time uh, coming to terms with that tragedy. Uh, it, it continues to follow him until a few years after the event, uh, he receives a letter. And that letter is from God. And uh, he is invited to come to that particular shack where his daughter had been found and, uh, and have a meeting with God. And there in that shack, Mac meets the Trinity. But to his surprise, God the Father looks a lot different from what he had imagined because she is a heavy Afro-American woman. And God the Son, somewhat less of a surprise, but still, he is a young man with very clear Arab traits. And then there is the Holy Spirit and she comes as a delicate girl with Asiatic appearance. 
So it's a very interesting book, by the way. It's well worth reading. And uh, there's also a movie that is worth watching. Well, one of my friends who teaches theology once told me, when I deal with the doctrine of God with my class, I require that they read this book. And I wondered why. Well, he said, I want them to be aware of the fact that when we are discussing God, when we are trying to think through who and what God is, we must know that he may be too, totally different from what we thought. And all images, whatever we have, fail do justice. And so God is the absolute other. And metaphors, even the metaphor of God as father, cannot say everything about God. Well, having said that, we do meet God in the Bible often uh, under the metaphor of a father. And I have a few texts here. There are many more. God as father in the Old Testament. For instance, in Exodus 4.22, where um, Moses is told, then go and say to Pharaoh, Israel is my firstborn son. So the implication is God is the father of Israel. Isaiah 64, where the prophet says, yet you, Lord, are our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. And in the Psalms, of course, the uh, metaphor of a father is used over and over again, as a father has compassion on his children, we find in Psalm 103, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. God as our father. Often we find this in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament. In Romans, the Apostle Paul says, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. St. Paul said, wrote to the Galatians, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. And Jesus, in Mark 14, he addressed God as Abba, Father, take this cup from me. Both in the Old and in the New Testament, it is very often that God is addressed as Father. But for many people, that is a major problem. Because the idea of a father comes across to many as a very patriarchal figure. Many do not have a loving father. And so when God is described as father, there is something that, that just doesn't work. It, it doesn't make a connection with God, but rather it tends to, to uh, create a rejection because being a father is not something, or having a father, a loving father, is not something that uh, everybody has experienced. In fact, many people have not. And so some people have suggested, well, maybe it's not such a good idea. This word father having that connotation of patriarchy, it may be better that in our day and age, we will God call God our mother. But is that a solution? Uh, it may be slightly better. The, the, uh, the reputation of mothers may be slightly better than that of fathers, but uh, not everybody has a loving 
uh, and tender, caring mother. So, yeah, you could say, maybe we could go also use the word mother because there are female images, associations of God uh, with, uh, with women in the, uh, in the Bible. Just two examples here. Isaiah 66, as a mother comforts her child, so will I and the I that is God comfort you. So God is here uh, connected with motherly care. And we find that in Hosea chapter 11. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. But then the more they went, the, the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals and they burned incense to images. To them, I was like one who lifts a little child to the cheek. That is often suggested, uh, explained as suggesting that there is God like a woman who lifts his child to his cheek and bend down to feed him. And then there is this female connection to association with feeding a child. So yes, there is some biblical justification maybe to think of God as a mother. But there are problems with the word father and there are problems with the word mother. Yet, in spite of these problems, Jesus tells us that maybe it is still a good way, a good word to use when we talk about God, when we address God. Because Jesus called his father Abba, Father. And we are told a few times in the New Testament that we should call Abba, Father. Apparently, that is a suitable, maybe the most suitable term. With all its limitations, it is usually an expression of the re relational character between God and us, an expression of love, care, and protection. This word Abba, and uh, as I told you at the beginning, I am no expert on uh, uh, these intricacies of the New Testament, but in many of the uh, books, the literature, we find an emphasis on the fact that Jesus spoke Aramaic, uh, the lingua franca of his days in that particular part of the Middle East. And Abba, many of the sources say, is a very intimate word in, Ara in Aramaic. It is uh, somewhat similar to our word daddy. It expresses intimacy, at the same time also the idea of obedience, because a child is to be obedient to his father. But intimacy, that is really the, uh, the key factor here. And it's truly amazing that we may address the ruler of the universe as Abba, that we may address him as Daddy, Papa. It includes, it implies that if we can address God in that way, then all God's children are our brothers and sisters. Now, we tend to use the word brother and sister uh, almost routinely. At least we used to. It's a little less now than it used to be. But to really accept our fellow believers as brothers and sisters, that is not always easy. And yet, if we can call God our daddy, our father, then... Uh, we must be aware of the fact that that means that we all are in the same boat and are brothers 
and sisters standing uh, before the great God of the universe. Our Father, our Father in heaven. Well, what is heaven? Actually, when we speak about heaven, there's also often the uh, 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 plural. And that, I understand, is uh, uh, often the case in both Hebrew and Greek. When God created the heaven and the earth, he uh, called the fault sky, we are told in Genesis 1 verse 8. And uh, in the King James, it is said that God called the fault heaven. That was a biblical way of speaking about heaven. The biblical view is often that there were three heavens, the atmosphere, the space where the heavenly bodies move, the second heaven, and then the third heaven, the place where God lives. In 2 Corinthians, Paul said that he was caught up to the third heaven, apparently the place where he believed God lived. Now, he had questions about that. He said whether that was in the body or outside of the body, I can't tell you. But somehow he was caught up, he said, to the place where God lived. Uh, Ellen White has a couple of statements where she uh, uh, looks at uh, the place where God lives, heaven, behind the uh, uh, Orion. Well, where is heaven? Where does God live? And you see, I've put the word live between quotation marks because, again, this is a very human way of speaking about God, that God lives somewhere. What does that word mean when applied to God? Does he live in a certain location uh, above us? When we think of God in heaven, we tend to look upwards. But of course, it depends on your place on planet Earth, whether you should look upwards or whether you should look the other way, uh, downward. Well, is God somewhere in space? Will maybe the James Webb telescope finally tell us where God lives or maybe some other contraption that we invent in the future? Is God somewhere? Or should we rather think of a different dimension? Whatever we say, heaven is beyond our comprehension. And we speak of a place because we have no better way of expressing ourselves, but we must realize that it is a very human way of expressing ourselves. Maybe we can compare it somewhat to what we say, what do we mean when we say that God lives in our heart? Uh, that of course does not mean that God is in that specific location, that uh, particular muscle, in our body, but yet it's a very meaningful way of expressing that God is and is near us. Whatever, heaven is a reality beyond the limitations of the time and the space of our created world. Our Father in heaven. There is a tension between those two elements, our Father, Abba, and heaven. Our Father, Abba, God is very close. In heaven, God is at the same time distant, unspeakably far away. And somehow we need those two elements. And I hope that is something that uh, we may uh, explore a little further in our discussion. A God who is too similar to our earthly father will not do. He cannot lift us from our limitations. 
But at the same time, a God who is far away, without this dimension of being close to us, being our Abba, with such a God, we cannot have an intimate relationship. A God who is only characterized by his heavenly stats. So these two elements, our Father in heaven, our Abba in heaven, there may be a tension. God is very close. God is far away. But in the prayer, our Father in heaven, these two elements are somehow connected. And I would suggest to you that that is an important element in our attitude towards God as our Father, very near our Abba, yet at the same time also the infinite God far away who is the creator of the universe. In saying our Father in heaven, we bring those two elements together. Let me finish with uh, giving you the Lord's Prayer as we find it in the message. Uh, sometimes it's good to read something in a different version or even in a paraphrase. Our Father in heaven, reveal who you are. Set the world right. Do what's best as above so below. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and from the devil. You're in charge. You can do anything you want. You are a blaze in beauty. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. I'm assuming the uh, uh, yes, yes, yes is uh, uh, amen. amen. Yeah. Verily, verily, verily. Yes. Yeah, this is very interesting. You know, I, just this week, uh, Reinder, I was editing a piece by uh, Harold Weiss. I don't know if you know Harold. He I do. Yeah. Your name. Uh, and he he made a distinction, and I thought of this when you were talking about whether God is um, imminent or or distant, whether God is near or far. He quoted a passage that I remember. He said the wisdom writers tended to see God as distant and mysterious. And he said, uh, he quoted the passage from Ecclesiastes, God is in heaven, you are on earth, therefore let your words be few. Mm -hmm. And he, he said the wisdom writers didn't seem to think that God was close, much less probably even understandable in any way. Because if you read through Ecclesiastes and Job and mm -hmm. even quite a bit of uh, the Psalms, not all, but, but a lot of the Psalms, uh, God is simply beyond our comprehension. God is going to do what God is going to do, and it is none of your business to try to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And so the, that, that's, that's what you put me in, in mind of as you were talking about that. Um, uh, Dr. Hemmings was uh, giving us some interesting things too, so I'm going to start with her here. Uh, I'm going to unmute you, my friend. Yes, I see there are 99 plus comments on the chat. Yeah, but it's, you know, it's one very of the problems when you are presenting is that you cannot at the same time follow the chat. That's so right. Please bring me up to date. Yeah, well, there is a there is a lot of discussion on uh, on, on honorifics and uh, how we you you started talking about. Uh, ich, Ich, uh, what is it? Uh, du versus sein in, in German. Mm -hmm. I was taught to always address my teachers when I studied German 
always address them with C rather than uh, do. But when we talk to one of the other students, we and I th this whole idea that that God is addressed in the familiar form in German and French that was new to me. I had never heard that before. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um, I don't know if I'm comfortable with that actually. Uh, but uh, Dr. Hemmings, uh, join the conversation here. Good afternoon. Uh... It's uh, rain, rain there. Uh, it's probably not afternoon for you. Thank you for your presentation. Rain there, you had me there. Thank you you, know, you, you kind of had me there when you were deconstructing the, you know, um, uh, sort of patriarchal images of God. But then you still held on to the pronoun his, you know, <laughs> even when you're referring to God as you know, in feminine terms, you are still holding on to the patriarchal language, his and so forth. I do understand your drift. I know uh, you're trying to explain to us the imminence, the nearness of God and so forth. And I you really, that powerful. For me, however, as a feminist theologian, I still find it problematic when we cannot deconstruct the whole idea of God as father. And the reason is this, some people might say this is, uh, you know, this is majoring in minors, but it is majoring in majors because language is a very powerful reflection of human formation and human understanding. And it's also a very powerful formation of human understanding. And so for me, when we insist on God as father and God as he and him, we continue to efface the image of God in womankind. And therefore to me, and you know, I always say to my students, if you hear me refer to God as he or him in this class or she or it, you let me know, put your hand up and I'll give you $10 every time I do that. I never mm -hmm. refer to God as a personal pronoun. And um, and I say, if you hear me say God, Father God in public, please know that Mother God is coming straight up right after that. Mm -hmm. uh, the point here is this. When we insist on this male imagery of God, I think we are perpetuating a culture that consistently, in spite of our project, seeks to, you know, diminish womankind and, as it were, efface the image of God in womankind. So to me, this... You know, like I said, you had me there and I thought you were going to deconstruct the, the patriarchal language. And at the end, I would think, you know, that God, you know, I, I honestly ran there and you're my friend. I cringe when people call out Father God, you know, I kind of cringe. It's not that I have a problem with Father God. It's just that I have a problem with this exclusive reference to God as Father, as though to say Mother God is some kind of heretical way. And people need to get used to also saying mother God and she, you know, that we use a pronoun she as well for God. People need to, to become oriented into that, knowing that God is neither male nor female, as you rightly said, that God transcends these things. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying if God is anything, if we use human language to refer to God, I think it needs to be inclusive. What do you think about that? Yeah. Well, what do I think? Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not surprised by your comments because I appreciate that you are a feminist theologian. And, uh, and I think that is, that is very appropriate that we come at scripture from different angles. Uh, I'm of course uh, handicapped by the fact that I'm a male. And, uh, and so that, uh, that is clear from also the way I, I tend to talk. Uh, I hope that what I try to say is that uh, if we call God Father, and uh, there is a 
lot of biblical precedents for that to call God Father. If we, but if we do so, uh, it is not a final uh, definition of God. Certainly not as male. It is a uh, it is a word that was given to us by Jesus Christ. Uh, but yes, we are living in a different uh, period of history now. And uh, uh, maybe the time has come to use uh, not just the symbol of father, but use also more female symbols. Yeah. Well, uh, as you were saying, yeah, but, uh, sorry, as you were saying, they used to refer to you as, you know, Dr. Bruce Marceau, but now they call you by your first name. So I thought you were moving into that evolution of the okay. way they're addressing, you know. I thought well, that would be my logical conclusion to uh, that. Have a, have a little hope and a little that I may just uh, <laughs> go through a little bit more of evolution myself. Yes. But I have I have a little problem with the fact not not a little, but uh, how can we talk about God without using either a male or a female pronoun? Uh, it, to me, is makes God less than a person, whatever the word person means. So uh, when I when I feel when I use the word, it or something similar in other languages, a non-personal pronoun referring to God, uh, I feel I'm not doing him, I'm doing him even, even less justice than I'm doing by calling him he, usually, or she. Well, I don't use a pronoun at all. I simply repeat the word God. <laughs> okay. I don't use he, she, or it. And I hear a lot of people do that. Okay. And uh, it's interesting to know that the um, Anglican Communion, uh, especially uh, where they're headquartered in in Great Britain, that they are they are moving towards you know um, uh, taking uh, not using male imagery uh, to refer to God, more inclusive inclusive imagery, recognizing how powerful the consistent, persistent male language about God, how powerful it is. In preventing, you know, uh, the, the 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 full development of civilization, we regard women as actually equal representatives of God on earth. Uh, I I was about to mention all of that. Uh, <clears throat> I had it in the back of my mind, and Lisa Samuelpinger just just wrote it into a comment in Finnish. I think I first learned this from Hannah Leachowski, who's a very uh, pastor's wife in Germany, very good feminist writer herself, uh, that in Finnish, uh, third-person pronouns aren't gendered at all. They're just, there's only one pronoun. Mm -hmm. And uh, that I, th I find that very interesting. I had no idea because some of the inflected languages are not just gendered, they have like I don't know, I, I don't know if Dutch has this, but in German they have male, female, and neuter. And yes, it's very complicated, and you have to make everything match up in the sentence to that. And uh, I remember how surprised I was to discover that uh, things that we would think of as being feminine uh, end up being neuter or masculine or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I, as I remember, uh, Freulein is das Freulein. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A D4 line, you would think, but it is so. It's very interesting how complex that gets. Uh, Olive, I, I want to follow up with a question to you. Uh, when, when I have pursued this line of thinking with some of my church members in the past, and by the way, I try really hard in editing Adventist today to get rid of all uh, all uh, gendered pronouns when referring to God. I'm not saying it, one will never slip through, but uh, we try really hard. And boy, it's awkward, Olive. You probably have found that too. When you're trying to edit something and and uh, you have to say, 
repeat God, 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 God over. And uh, somebody has suggested God's self. I've used that occasionally. Sometimes you have to, to twist the whole sentence around in order to say that, to, to get God as not he or him. It, it's hard. But when we're doing that, and uh, we're doing this with, with people who are not used to this, they're used to referring to God as he, aren't we really dealing with a bit of a hermeneutical interpretive problem here? Do you have the right, somebody said to me once, do you have the right to reassign God a different gender than the one that Jesus gave you? And they, you know, just laid it right out there. Do you get to do that? Uh, the Bible says God is our father and he is he and Jesus said so. Are, aren't we dealing with really a pretty much of a, 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 an interpretive uh, Bible interpretive problem here? Well, again, that's where we need to help people to understand principles of interpretation. Jesus was a historical figure. Um, Jesus came in as human, historical. He was not immune. He was not sterile to or, or, or to culture and uh, and to the way. So Jesus wouldn't get up in an a ancient Near Eastern culture and say, "God, our our mother is in heaven" or whatever. Um, but the thing is, people do not. I even test my classes semester. They do not notice that I don't use an agenda term for God. They never notice it for some reason. Because mm -hmm. I just, that's just how I've, I'm accustomed to speaking and I become comfortable with it. And when I ask them, they never notice. It's it's just not noticeable. Mm -hmm. The more you become uh, confident and used to it, nobody notices that you're not using gender language, you know. But of course, in certain instances, you know, I may push the envelope and say she just to make somebody think, you know, <laughs> or whatever. It, it, and it does, too. It, it yeah. jumps you if you're not expecting it. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting, though. I don't know, Ryan, there, how you look at this hermeneutically. But when we talk about the spirit of God, it doesn't appear anywhere in the Bible as as, as, as uh, in a masculine gender. It appears as feminine Old Testament and neuter in the New Testament. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, I don't know how you see that oh that's true and certainly also in the uh, uh as far as i know in the uh, early christian literature the spirit was often referred to in feminine terms that is interesting yes and and uh, when you really think about it the immortal immortal invisible god only wise why does it have does that being have to have any kind of gender at all. But as you said in your presentation, we want to make God somehow approachable enough that we can at least talk with God. Mm -hmm. And uh, that that's, it, it's hard. I, I'm, I'm just saying here, I, I uh, just this week, I, I, I edited about five different pieces for going into the magazine. And there were he's for God all over the place. Mm -hmm. And uh, I struggled with some of them, Olive. I really did. I just like, what am I going to do? I, I, you know, is somebody going to nap me and say, boy, you sure made an awkward sentence out of that one, Lauren. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm taking up so much of the conversation. Oh, this is a good I mean, conversation. Just a personal experience right there in terms of applying your principle of God being imminent, present, and with us. Um, just God in heaven, close by. Mm -hmm. When I was... When I had my uh, my daughter, which was our second child, it was very difficult. You know, it was you know a lot of hemorrhaging. I thought I was going to die. And you know, when this this was the first time I approached God as my mother, mm -hmm. I was young, very young then, I hadn't developed theologically yet. But I knelt down at my bed and I said, "God, my mother," because I felt I was going to die. Because as yeah. father, you do not understand what I'm suffering right now. That's exactly mm -hmm. what I said. And it, it, in that sense, for me, God was clearly present as understanding who I am and what I was experiencing as a child there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's from then my theology you know, developed as far as, you know, yeah. gender. But I think our, our discussion uh, actually illustrates the fact that how difficult it is 
to uh, to find adequate human language to describe God. This is part of the struggle that we have. And uh, the, the, the bottom line, I think, is that we must be aware of the fact that all our speaking about God is so limited. And all our doctrinal understanding is so limited because we only have our own words. And uh, yeah, you, you emphasize the fact that cultures change and that we are now living in a different uh, culture than when Jesus spoke those words, Abba, Father. And what you just said about the fact that Jesus was in a way culturally uh, conditioned, I, I fully accept that was part of his, uh, his human, humanhood, his humanity. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I, I was uh, also working on an article this week about uh, about Arius, who thought that uh, Jesus was uh, just ha a man who happened to be adopted as God's son. And I thought that was pretty interesting too. Uh, uh, Terry, Terry, join this conversation. How are things out on Whidbey Island? Oh, pleasant. Uh, sun shining today. Oh my! But. Not bad. I was going to comment that anytime we anthropomorphize um, onto God characteristics of any kind, <clears throat> they're going to lead to misunderstandings. I mean, because God is not us. Christ came to show us the way and clearly, I think, showed us and taught us and lived his life in a way that indicated that that way was going to be easily recognizable to the world. But it wasn't a person. It was a way to live. And I think we could have learned something from the Tao Te Ching in chapter one, because when we try to define what God is rather than what the way is, I think we miss it. And in that, in that, uh, in that writing from ancient China, we have a lot of stuff that's very compatible with Christianity. But we went our own way, and I think it was primarily because we wanted to carry on the characteristics of a male god, which involves and includes violence. So we kept the male god because it had violence in it. Mm -hmm. And with all due respect, I think even in the the uh, matriarchal societies, they even had some violence. But I think that if we confine our view of God to what Christ represented, then we see that it is not male or female. It's not Jew or Gentile. It's not right or wrong. It's whether we have love in our hearts. Hmm. Okay. That's there isn't a there isn't a clear black and white choice. And mm -hmm. we separate all of these characteristics by male and female. It's just not it's going to be a problem forever if we don't get out of it. And I think the world knowing what it knows about the extent of the universe and how far it has gone and how well hidden whatever God is is that they'd be more interested in the love and the the way than in some specific theology or belief system. You know, I I, I jumped onto one part of what you said, Terry. I, I hope I I'm 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 not I don't want to get away from that that concept of this is a is a is a way a system rather than. Uh, anthropomorphizing God, but Reinder, this, this part jumped out at me. Are we somehow hooked on a strong God? And that's why we make God male and make him a father and make him a general in some ways. Uh, you know, the, this the, uh, back in the uh, early 20th century, there was a in the late 19th and early 20th century, there is a, a movement to not have a feminized God. 
to have a, a robust, strong, masculine, uh, maybe violent even, God. Mm-hmm. And they would picture God with big muscle, or Jesus <clears throat> with big muscles. And uh, yeah, that's that, that. I think that's a really good insight. And I, I, Terry, I see it more in the Old Testament than in the New Testament. But, uh, you know, there, there, there's a certain, when I've been involved in, a uh, few times I've been involved in men's ministries, uh, there, there's a, a sort of discomfort in the room when they, when they kind of talk about being gentle and kind. Men want to be strong and masculine. I don't know, Reinder, we jump in here. Well, it seems that that has been one of the uh, uh, things that are associated with uh, with fundamentalism. Uh, mm. This idea of the strong, the yes. strong God. But uh, what I had hoped to underline in uh, uh, my uh, my presentation is that uh, all we say about God is human talk yes but uh, that does not mean that it's totally meaningless uh it is the only way we have about talking about god but and that is true when we also i believe uh, formulate our doctrines is that when we have said mm-hmm. something we need to take a step back and say well, yes, yes. Yeah. this is what we think at yeah. this moment. These are the words that we have, but God is greater than that. And so we have to take a step back and uh, and see that is always work in progress when we talk about God. Uh, but uh, what I had hoped to underline is in this very sentence, our Father in heaven, and, and just leaving the, the, the gender bit a, a little bit aside, uh, I see there the fact that this God is in a way that I don't understand, uh, infinitely far away from me as the creator of the universe and what it means that he lives somewhere. Well, what does the word somewhere mean? What does the word live mean? It is a concept. These are concepts that when applying to God, they only pose further questions. But that God is at the one time this mysterious, totally other. He apparently is at the same time uh, someone, and again, that is a word that I use advisedly, but... Uh, uh, who is uh, very close, uh, uh, and we can sit, as it were, on the lap of the uh, uh, ruler of the universe. Those those two elements are true of God at the same time, and that makes it worthwhile also to to worship this God. If he were only totally other and had no uh, real intimate tie with me then uh, that would not be a god uh, that would uh, really satisfy my need uh, if he were just my buddy very close daddy whatever word uh, that would not be sufficient either because god needs to be greater than that uh, so this is something that that I read in that in that one short sentence. Very interesting, Terry. You you opened some good discussion there. Thank you very much. And I'm going to go on to uh, Dr. Martin. How are you, Bob? Uh, fine, thank you, Lauren. Good. Thank you, um, Dr. Burzum. As always, I really enjoyed enjoyed your presentation. Very enlightening. Um, Dr. Hemmings' um, comments actually brought to mind two things. One, um, in the mid-80s, I was an undergraduate student at 
St. John's University, as in it's a Catholic university, and even non-Catholics are forced to do theology and take courses in theology, including Catholic um, catechism. And um, I took a course, which I thought would be interesting, called um, Feminist Theology. And it was taught by a nun. And the first thing she said, which brought to mind Dr. Hemming's point, was that anyone in this class who used um, a male pronoun to identify, to identify God will lose points on the final grade. <laughs> and now I think about it, it was pretty um, um, thoughtful of her because this was in the mid 80s. We are, and um, see how progressive she was in that regard in the mid 80s. And the second point is um, in the Adams administration, one of the things we tell commissioners of city agencies is that you must ensure that you get the permission from each staffer in your agency to identify the um, proper personal pronoun that will be used to identify them. And we noticed that there are that there were some who used a um, neuter gender, a, you know, non non gender pronoun. Again, coming back to um, um, Dr. Hemming's point. So it is possible, you know, it is possible, I think. And it could be that we are so conditioned by the historical patriarchal traditions that it's really a challenge for us to, to do that. So my two questions, um, Dr. Bersmill. One, the little sectarian in nature. Um, at my local... Anglican Church that I visit from time to time. And as we know, there are the prayers are, you know, the book of prayers and the prayers are written out in each, even in each services, each Sunday's program, you have the prayers for um, for that particular service. Um, do you think this is um, a product of the written prayers from the early church? Jesus did, do you think it's, that's the root of it? And and do you think that's why um, Adventists don't do that? And the second thing is, um, would it be? What do you think about the efficacy of God being identified as a concept? Since the pronouns always run into problem, you know the the um, patriarchs want a strong, violent God. Um, those who need God's comfort will use the female model. But what about the, the, the efficacy of seeing God as a concept? So he's all things to everyone just as a concept outside of the parameters of um, the male and female genders. Those are my questions. Well, about the Book of Common Prayer, of course, uh, I know about it and I have uh, uh, seen uh, some of the prayers, I have not been very often in an Anglican church. Uh, these have originated, of course, over time. The Com Book of Common Prayer has been revised a number of times also and mm -hmm. has been made more up to date in its language, etc. And that is probably a process that will continue. Uh, I'm a little envious of churches that have that kind of a tradition. Uh, these prayers are often so beautiful and so uh, so deep that they contrast uh, rather with many of the prayers that I hear in Adventist worship services. And uh, whether maybe we would not want to have an Adventist version of a book of prayer, but I certainly uh, would want uh, a bit more liturgy. Uh, if I were, <laughs> it could have my say. And uh, I would certainly uh, uh, want people to give very close attention to their prayers, write them out, think about it, and... Uh, in most cases, at least, uh, prepare them very, uh, very thoroughly. 
And of course, then when you do prepare them very thoroughly, you may also be able to give more attention to the use of pronouns and the kind of images that we use to uh, to address God. Mm -hmm. uh, whether to think of God more as a concept than as a person. Well, what I said about the word person is the word person is not adequate. God is more than than that. But I would say that that the things that we associate with the idea of a person, uh, it's difficult to associate them to the same extent with the idea of a concept. And uh, in order to have a relationship, to have a uh, trust, and mm -hmm. these things that that are part of, of, of our worship, I think we need more than a concept. And uh, for the time being, uh, I want to stick with the idea of a person, even though I know its limitations. Okay, thank you, thank you. Good, good question, Bob. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to move on to uh, Dr. Turner. Let me see, I'll, I'll mute you there. And uh, go ahead, uh, nice to have you here. How are things over in Northern England today? Beautifully sunny and bright and a high of three degrees Celsius. Well, at least you have the sun. Yeah, it's not always a source of heat in this part of the world. I understand. Uh, here in Ohio, we have uh, we have almost all winter. It's it's kind of rare to see the sun. We have gray, gray, gray weather. It's very tiresome. Uh, so I'm I'm envious. And you have a lot of water, Lawrence. Lots, yes, lots of localized flooding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, Rainda, thank you very much for your for your presentation, and it's quite stimulating. I just wanted to make a brief comment, really, and that is. Um, I think it, it could be helpful for us to consider the way in which the Bible uses uh, metaphor and figurative language. Um, for example, just take uh, the book of Hosea. Um, Hosea uses more metaphors for God than any other biblical author. So in, this, in the scope of that one book, he uses, I think, it's at least 40 different metaphors for God. So God is a husband, a father a farmer, a lion, a leopard, a mother bear, and, and so on and so forth. He goes through numerous of these, uh, these metaphors. And yet he also says something else. Uh, he has God saying, I am God and not human. So uh, Hosea gives us numerous metaphors of all kinds, but also numerous human metaphors. And yet at the same time, is saying, don't think that any one of these metaphors is an essential definition of God, because I am God, not man. In other words, God loves like a human being, but as, as God. So perhaps one way of looking at this is rather than asking what approved vocabulary can we use to talk about God, in worship or elsewhere, to open the gates and say, use your imaginations to think of analogies and metaphors for God that do him or her justice. Um, because I think I'm with you. I think if we move towards conceptual ideas or never using or never using personal pronouns, perhaps, then it diminishes the, the personality of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that's all I wanted to say. I understand, Lawrence, that you have recently uh, written a uh, uh, commentary on the Book of Hosea. I haven't not on no, I haven't written on the Book of Hosea. I've just finished the commentary, which is this gives me a uh, opportunity for an advert here. Um, I've written a commentary on First and Second Samuel. Okay, for the new. For the new um, SDA International Bible Commentary, which is going to be published this month. 
and is a bargain at the price. Okay. Uh, no, I thought that you were uh, that you were writing on, on Hosea, but uh, no, now I remember it was on uh, on the book of uh, of Samuel. But I think that is a very worthwhile addition to uh, to 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 uh, remind us of the fact that the number of metaphors that have been used and are being used of God uh, is uh, is uh, well. Uh, there are so many that uh, we uh, the, the very fact that we need so many metaphors tells us something about all the various aspects of God that we somehow try to uh, to uh, to uh, to put in the spotlight. And uh, you're always uh, uh, pointing out also that we need to use our imagination. And that is certainly also a very valuable, valuable point. Yes, thank you, Dr. Turner. As long as you're you're fresh off of uh, writing about Samuel, how how is God uh, conceived of in the historical writings? Uh, well, uh, it's difficult to put into 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 one um, one package. I mean, obviously. Um, the the type of metaphors used in the Bible tend to be contextually relevant. So, for example, in the books of Samuel, you've got a problem with 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 monarchy, with the, with the kings, mm -hmm. and so the metaphor used of God um, and the uh, the analogies used tend to be mon monarchical because it is God who is the true leader of Israel. Um, in Hosea that I just mentioned, the situation is different and the problem is different, and therefore the metaphors used about him are different. So it's the situation that creates the possibility for coining fresh metaphors. So mm. that should give us courage in the in the 21st century to think of what might be um, appropriate contemporary metaphors for God in, in our situation, because the Bible is doing it all the time. That That's where theology arises. Theology arises where the ancient text meets the contemporary scene, and theology arises from that. The problem comes when the biblical text met people in the 18th century, and we've stuck with the metaphors and analogies that they use then. It's no longer speaking to to us so uh probably time for us to move to president god or prime minister god or uh um well well the, the yes <laughs> i was hesitating thinking of uh, calling god mr president but um it, it it's something which arises from the culture in which we live uh, mm -hmm. for those of us of course who don't benefit from a Republican ideal and still live with a constitutional monarchy, we might find we're using different metaphors depending on where we're speaking. Exactly, very good. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Alexander, I'm going to, oh, I guess you already are unmuted, so you go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brisma, for that exposition on that one line in the Lord's Prayer, that's, that's really pretty enlightening. I think we need to bear in mind that the Bible is, for the most part, a product of matriarch, of patriarchy. Um, the fact that what Lawrence just said about 40 different metaphors for God, I, I think is a very important point, uh, because every single metaphor, if, if it becomes a fixation, is doing violence to the nature of God. But during Jesus' time, patriarchy was the prevailing mindset. And so he had to address the people in terms that they would understand and relate to. So he did talk about God as father for, for the most part. But I find it interesting that in the Gospel of Luke, where we see him telling three parables that make the same one point. The parable of the lost son, the parable of the lost sheep, and the parable of the lost coin. And I wondered, why is he telling three parables? Can't they get the point after one? I mean, most of the time it's just one, but it's a cluster of three. And when I looked at it, I said, 
who is representing God in the parable of the lost son? Okay, that's his father. That sounds familiar. Who is representing God in the parable of the lost sheep? It's a shepherd. Fine. That's a person at a lower socioeconomic level of, of, of Israel at the time. Now, who is representing God in the saving capacity in the parable of the lost coin? The woman. Now, just think how revolutionary that concept was that a woman could be representing God in a saving capacity. So we know that Jesus saw women as equals by how he treated them. But I think these parables were told in such a way that it was a gentle pushback against patriarchy so that women knew that they too could represent God in a saving capacity. Well, thank you very much for giving me an idea for a sermon on <laughs> those three parables. Thank you. Yes, those, they're very, very good. Uh, yes, I, I had not uh, put those together like that. And okay. that's very good. You may have a sermon out of, out of that one too, Horace. Actually, I do. <laughs> okay. He actually already wrote it. <laughs> he's just, he's doing what a lot of us preachers do, right? Or he's uh, telling us a sermon he's already written. He's preaching it to us. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Couldn't help myself. <laughs> Yeah, but, but I can still do a sermon on it. You know, I, I'll make sure that I won't try to read uh, Dr. Alexander's sermon first. <laughs> do, you, do you have to give him credit for it? Do you have to give him a footnote when you... Uh, well, maybe, yes, yes. Uh, that won't be necessary. I'm sure I didn't originate all of that. I'm sure I borrowed it somewhere. I can't remember where you're from. So feel free to use it. Okay. I, uh, I sometimes tell... When uh, I talk to writers for Adventists today, and they say, "Well, how do you want me to develop this?" and I'll, and I'll just, you know, having a, been a lifetime preacher, I'll go off and give just give them lots of lots of ideas, and then I always finish and say, "Please just use these ideas. Don't say Lauren tell, told me to say or Lauren gave me these ideas. Just use them. Just take them and make them your own." Because I, I I want them to to completely own whatever they write. So yeah, I like that. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm not preaching anymore. And I would have used that idea too. Uh, so thank you. And uh, next week we're going to take a look at. Uh, by the way, just a reminder: next week, uh, Dr. Alexander is going to be teaching us. He's going to be teaching on uh, Samson. So that should be interesting. Uh, Chris. I'm going to ask you to unmute and join the conversation here. Oh, well, it's just nice to be here. I was uh, at my brick and mortar church for much of the December holiday season, and it was just nice to be here for the whole time today. Uh, Dr. Brunsma, um, I'm going to just steer away from the Our Father part and to In Heaven part. Um, and I've just enjoyed, you know, being in the chat like I frequently type too fast and way too much. Um, many are probably weary of my my uh, drivel in the chat. But um, we often think of heaven then as a as a physical place, just as God is male, heaven is a walled city, much like Jerusalem was. the The New Jerusalem will mirror the old Jerusalem with parapets and stone walls and gates that open and close. And there was a comment in the chat about, we think of God as having a, this physical reality that we would be able to go up to him and look him in the eye, anthropomorphizing God again. We would hold his hand, we would hug him, we would... Uh, embrace them. We can walk with God every day. We use all these terms that are based on our own physicality. I'd, uh, my question is, what uh, what physicality is there or is there not in terms of heaven? When I go up past Orion, as Ellen White says, I will on the resurrection morning, and I will meet my deceased family there how is that going to work since our spacemen need 
oxygen to even orbit the earth and things like that. That's that's kind of my question as to how do the laws of, of humanity get suspended when on the resurrection morning I head into outer space without rocket power or anything else? That seems like a bit of a pipe dream and maybe just a fairy tale. Um, how do we talk about that in our current context? Well, when we describe uh, heaven as uh, with a lot of physicality, to use that word, uh, then many of us need that in order to have some idea of what is awaiting them. And without that kind of uh, concreteness, they would be lost. Uh, Others uh, feel that that concreteness is actually a barrier to their faith in the hereafter. When I think of the New Jerusalem with streets of gold and the things that are described there, then uh, I think, well, I think I prefer Amsterdam <laughs> to the New Jerusalem. Uh, but too much concreteness for me is actually a barrier. Uh, the thing is that we cannot think of, at least most of us, I think, cannot think of the afterlife unless there are some concrete aspects to it. And yet, at the same time, we have to say, uh, okay, I have this picture but it's going to be different. Uh, one of our previous popes spoke of, uh, I think it was Benedict actually, that it is heaven is a dimension rather than a locality. Well, that sounds good, but I don't really understand what that means either. So, I have to be content with the fact that I believe there is going to be something, an afterlife. There will be some kind of continuity because without continuity, it would be meaningless. Uh, but there will be a major amount, an infinite amount of discontinuity. And uh, I think the only things that really uh, inspire me when I read the last chapters of the Bible is that all these awkward things that we have today will no longer be there. Uh, disease, uh, death, uh, evil people, it's no longer there. So... That is the picture of heaven that uh, that I find attractive. And uh, uh, but as far as the physicality of it all, uh, I have more questions than uh, than I can ever answer. I I think when you consider the Lord's prayer, and we turned it into not a model prayer, but an actual prayer to pray, word mm -hmm. for word from whatever version of the Bible you memorized it in. I think that's one thing we did. And a second thing is to discuss the inadequacy of language, as we've been talking about. God as Father, Mother, yes, both. Uh, I like the hymns where it says, uh, in O Sacred Head Now Wounded, what language shall I borrow to thank thee, dearest friend? I, my language is inadequate to thank the God of heaven for doing what is revealed for the message of salvation or the song, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. We realize our language is utterly inadequate. How do we define the infinite? We simply create 40 metaphors, and even there, we've just scratched the surface, as you said. So it's nice to, like Ecclesiastes say, sit down, like Job, the end of Job, Job sat down and he zipped his lip, stopped talking about mm -hmm. God and just let God talk to him. There's an idea. Um, 
And, and I think it's just good to sit down and say, I don't have all the answers. I can't codify it into my 28 fundamental beliefs. I would need 28 bazillion ideas to understand the infinite one that is out there. So thank you for today. Yeah, and there's yeah. another sermon there for me. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you sound you sound a little bit like the uh, the preacher of Ecclesiastes. God is in heaven; you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. And there's a time for that too. Uh, you know, it reminded me, Chris, of a joke I have used, a mildly com funny story I have used in sermons, where the man insists on taking his suitcase full of gold to heaven. I love that one. And uh, he gets there and St. Peter says, uh, I'm glad to have you here, but to why did you bring your own paving material? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a, I, I've used it in a sermon a time or two, and it's, it's kind of funny. But in I, fact, I, if you I, really I, think about it, gold would not make very good paving material with it. No. Here's a wonderful joke I heard off of a podcast. It's a, a man who's a preacher, he goes to heaven and St. Peter is there at the gate and says, uh, well, you, how, what, what do you have to merit you to come in? You apparently, he looks him up on his clipboard and says, you need a, you, you apparently need a hundred points. And the man says, well, I was a pastor for 40 years. And so St. Peter says, okay, one point per year, that's 40 points. What, what else have you got? Well, I, I fed the homeless on, on holidays. Okay. How many holidays? That's one point each, uh, you know, seven. Anyway, the man realizes he's not going to come up with enough points to make it into heaven. And as he's standing there at St. Peter's desk, a man comes up behind him, waves at St. Peter. St. Peter waves back, and the man just walks right in through the pearly gates. And the, the pastor there at the desk says, wait a minute, how come he just walked right through? And St. Peter says, Oh, he's not playing your game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good one. Beverly, oh. so nice to have you here. Where are you from, Beverly? Well, I'm in New York. I'm in uh, Westchester County, New York, northern Westchester um, okay. in New York. And I've okay. been really enjoying the, uh, the conversation. But at the risk of uh, beating a dead horse, uh, with Dr. Brinsmar, if I'm not, forgive me for not pronouncing it correctly. Um, you, you spoke about, you know, obviously the model prayer that Christ gave to his disciples and it began with our father and, you know, talking about this whole gender descriptor, which, you know, I, I certainly embrace, but how do we beyond having, beyond, um, a, an explanation that, well, Christ used the term our father because of the place and time and context within which he lived. And that's what the, the, the disciples would re would receive and understand. At least that's, you know, how I, I would, how I would grasp it. Many of, many of um, us as Adventists and other elements of Christi of Christendom and certainly in, uh, uh, fundamentalists, uh, they will say, well, you know, we, we're, they're very literal in their understanding, extremely, extremely literal. So if it says our father, they can't move past that. So I'm wondering what would be some possible other explanations or understandings that could be shared to help to reach people like that who are kind of stuck. Well, you know, Jesus did say our father, and that's our template um uh, prayer model and it starts with our father so you know god is therefore of male gender i don't know how would we address the, those types of limited arguments as they yeah, be, you know, know, limited as they are may, maybe to those people who have that mindset it it, it might be best to uh, to continue using the father metaphor mm -hmm. And at the same time, try to do something about the uh, the the way of thinking that is behind there, and and help people understand that words 
even though we find them in the Bible fit into a certain culture, and that there is a different approach to scripture possible that will actually uh, uh, be much more meaningful for today's generation. So uh, I think that larger uh, issue uh, needs to be addressed, but that is not uh, done in one sermon, is not one done overnight, but it's something that, uh, that maybe a local church has to work on harder, uh, or you know, maybe it's too much to hope that the de denomination as a whole will make uh, more progress uh, very, very quickly. But certainly, I think uh, a pastor in a church or a faith community in a local church uh, can try to move along that way and, uh, and then uh, help with uh, seeing uh, that... Uh, the Bible has this cultural and temporal aspects uh, and that there is more meaning behind there if we uh, if if we can see that. Yes, very good, Beverly. Uh, yeah, it, you know, it, it occurs to me, uh, Reinder, that uh, beyond the uh, gender aspect, and this is something I'm sure Olive has wrestled with at some point along the line, a lot of us, grew up with God as a uh, Solomon's head of Christ, uh, a good looking white man with low dried hair up in sky. And oh, Jesus, Jesus looked like that. And so God is kind of somehow a, a, a big white man too. And all of those, those things could be reconstructed in some way. I mean, really, I, I remember the first time I, I saw a a Bible that had pictures of God as a dark-skinned man. It was kind of j jarring to me. Uh, and uh, I had to readjust my thinking. It was very good for me to do that. But there's all kinds of ways in which our pictures of God probably are uh, restrictive to us. Mm -hmm. So I really, pre this has been a very good conversation. And I'm going to... Uh, my, my colleague, well, he was, Steve Siciliano was my colleague. He was a fellow pastor, and now he's moved into the conference office, and I don't even know how to address him anymore. Okay. He's, uh, he's way above me at this point. I, I never got to be a conference officer. So, Very Steve, funny. Uh, yeah. I, Steve and I, I'm just glad to have you here, my friend. My preferred uh, uh, label is Steven, so he already got that right. All right. And, uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here today. It turned out that I was not scheduled anywhere else, and I kind of waited, and then I said, let's just take a day off. So it's the first time I'm able to join in a long time, so it's nice to be back. Nice to see you, Dr. Brownsma, too. I'm glad I arrived on one of your days. Um, I, I suppose I'm not the only one that sees that there's a commonality between two of the topics that have come up about how to conceptualize where heaven is and how to understand God, the gender of God, if there is such a thing. Basically, I think what we're trying to do is go back in time to understand what the ancients believed, which is the source of our religious tradition. And yet some of those pieces don't seem to fit anymore. So we're, we're in a process of adapting on both of those points. Uh, in terms of the gender of God issue, I think a key for us might be to go back and consider what did the surrounding peoples in the ancient Near East think of God? How did they view God? I assume they thought of God as a personal, a person, like a human. They may even have thought of, uh, if they thought of one God, they may have thought of, uh, of God as a male. Although I think they, in a polytheistic society, they probably had multiple gods. But in any case, we're adapting something from two and 3,000 years ago into our own setting. And in terms of the heaven, the location of heaven, you have to. We have to do that. We don't live in a three-tiered universe anymore. You know, so both of these things are matters of adaptation from the ancient worldview to our own. Mm -hmm. And in the case of the cosmology, we're forced to do that. 
So that leads then to the other question, <laughs> maybe the more touchy one for us Adventists is, are we allowed to do that? Or are we stuck to what is called the quote unquote biblical worldview? All right, now a lot of fundamentalists inside the Adventist church and outside would say, no, that's it. We This is where we get our view from. We don't take any outside input. We insist on adopting a biblical worldview. That's one option. If we choose not to take that option, then my question is this. Do, are there any guidelines or boundaries, or are we just like freewheeling and on our own? Uh, I said a lot of things there, but let me just sum it up. Basically, what we're talking about today in regard to both of these issues is how do we adopt an ancient worldview to our own and yet retain the spiritual aspects that we are in need of and that we want to keep? If we say we can't do it, biblically we can't, we're tied to the Bible, then it just doesn't fit anymore. I think a lot of people would agree with that. Um, right. And if we don't, and if we don't, if we say, hey, we'll, we'll make up our own stuff now, are there any boundaries to it? I guess that's my question. Thank you. Okay. I, I think that uh, even those people who say that we, we should not adapt because the Bible is as it is, they don't, they don't stick by that rule themselves. Uh, even those people who say that you need to take everything literally, they don't do it themselves. I have once asked uh, the president of our church whether he believed in the flat earth. And he said, don't be ridiculous. I said, well, you have to because you are talking about everything being literal. And so it is clear that the Bible has four corners, the, the earth has four corners. And a sphere cannot have corners. So may, maybe that is uh, something very simple. But in fact, when you look at it, everybody makes a selection as to what you take literal and what you do not take literal. Uh, some just uh, stop at a certain point, uh, and some feel that they can go further. And I think that, uh, and that follows from what uh, Dr. Turner just uh, said, that as time moves on, we need new words, we need new metaphors, we need uh, new images in order to, uh, uh, to, to make sure that our faith is relevant. And uh, I believe that uh, borders, well, maybe there, there are no borders that, 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 that are easily defined. But if we move forward as a faith community, if we, uh, we uh, um, make use of the expertise of our theologians, if we uh, uh, stay together and listen to one another, and uh, even if we are willing to move in different at different speeds, then uh, we 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 can we can make progress. And I think uh, if we uh, if we keep on listening and dialoguing, we can avoid uh, extremism. And uh, and things that that do not hold. Uh, well, that's probably the best I can do with this this question. I think that's pretty good. And and you, what you do, what I think I hear you saying is it throws us back as a community. Yeah. To to settle some of these issues. I think so. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Good question. And uh, hey, it's, it's just good to see your face again. It's been a, so long. We need to we need to get together again. Linda, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Brinsma, I, I appreciated your presentation, and I really appreciated your article in this week's Evanist Today as well. Uh, yes. It really, really touched my heart. I, I was grateful for it. It was a good message. 
Uh, the thing I just wanted to mention briefly is that years ago, a friend of mine, a Jewish friend of mine, gave me a copy of the book, The Sacred and Profane, by Mircea Iliadi, Dr. Iliadi, who, as I understand it, many years ago, was the chair of the Department of History of Religion at University of Chicago. And in this book, he talks about the fact that many ancient religions, and I think most of us have heard about this somewhere along the way, but that many ancient religions had some type of a creation story that was similar to our account in Genesis. Uh, there was some universality there to that. But the thing he goes on further to talk about is that many of these ancient religions developed the belief that the creator God was no longer interested in them. That, uh, I'm going to use the male pronoun because Dr. Iliadi did, that he was bored with his creation, he was disinterested, kind of wanting to move on to other things, and was not really available <clears throat> to the people here, which is why they invented intermediate gods that were more readily uh, uh, accessible to them, like a god of fertility, a god of harvest, god of rain. And that the Christian approach has always been to reverse that. If you think about it, it's almost perhaps more sinister to paint a picture of a god who just doesn't care about you as opposed to one who perhaps is critical of you or, or whatever. I mean, disinterest is uh, is a very potent thing. Uh, it's very alienating. And so I guess the thing that I would say that I feel like we've missed a bit by your wonderful presentation is the fact that God is approachable. Uh, mm -hmm. Jesus gave us the prayer that you spoke about so beautifully today because, in fact, God is not disinterested. He is not unavailable. He is not off somewhere else. Uh, ignoring us. And I think it's to our um, it's it's to our harm if we forget that that principle, that principle component. Um, and I know it's true because when I taught the Sabbath school lesson, the first one in Psalms this morning, being a rather lazy sort, I told everybody last week, I said, come ready in mind to speak about your favorite psalm. And be sure you do so that you're not like, you know, thumbing, thumbing through during prayer with your eyes open in case you forgot to do it. But these 15 or so people, 12, 15 people that are in the class on Zoom, we meet. Everyone had the, the, the psalm that they chose that was important to them. It was because of whatever methodology was described in, in the poem, in the song, was particularly God's way of reaching out to them. God's accessibility to them. And so I, I just would hate for us to miss that what to me is the overarching principle in the prayer that, you know, the words we can toy with the words or the pronouns or the, you know, the images, whatever. But the key element to me is that, is that we can, we can approach God directly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Because that is uh, really underlining an important point that uh, that we must not miss. Thank you. Very central point. Thank you, Linda. Very good. Um, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Fortan is here. Uh, please good afternoon. Have a conversation. Oh, by the way, you had you you just wrote a book too. You might want to mention uh, while you're on here. Uh, Sure, I could do that. It's good to be joining you here this afternoon, Reindeer. Thank you for your wonderful presentation, and and it's it's good to hear you again. Um, yeah, a book, sure. The I have written a biography on uh, George Butler, part of the Adventist Pioneer series, like many of the other books that have been published so far, and should be coming out in about a month, I'm told end of January, beginning of February. So um, you may hear about this one coming out too. Uh, and I hope it's well received. Um, okay, joining this conversation here, I had a few thoughts to mention, but already I think a number of speakers just before me have said uh, what I wanted to say about the reality of heaven uh, and the, uh, the concepts of worldview and how the biblical authors, when they talked about God, when they talked about heaven, had an understanding of reality that is very different from ours. 
And so, uh, you know, we were smiling a few times here during the conversation this afternoon about Orion, about when we get to heaven, how are we going to do the transport uh, without oxygen in all of this? No, these these are questions that are our questions because of how we understand the world, how we understand the geography of the world, planet Earth and, and the solar system and galaxies. But the Bible authors did not know anything about this. And for them, heaven is very close to them. The reality of where God is in the heavens is not, you know, uh, light years away. Uh, you just have to read a number of these Bible stories uh, th through the lens of heaven is very close. And, and you will see this happen, I think. Uh, think of the, uh, the Tower of Babel. They really believed that if they could build a, a construction, a tower high enough, they would be able to reach heaven. And so God intervenes and stops that. Uh, a lot of the prayers we hear about in the Old Testament, uh, the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal on, on the mountain there. Well, maybe you need to speak a little louder because he's sleeping and he's not hearing you. Uh, Elijah, you know, makes fun of the prophets. They have a conception, yes, that, that God can hear their prayers. And that's why prayers are spoken. They're not, they're not recited in one's mind or in one's heart. Prayers have, be, have to be audible for God to hear the prayer. And so on. I mean, there's a number of other little facts like this in the Old Testament that helps us understand that. So I really appreciated the comment that was made a little earlier that perhaps heaven is another dimension. Maybe that's one way to think about it, uh, to not be so graphic and, and detailed and understand geography and try to figure out where in the solar system and is the Jebs, is the Webb telescope going to find one day where heaven is? Uh, or perhaps, I don't know, uh, but is, is that the right question? Certainly it's not a question I think that the Bible authors would ask themselves. I just wanted to add this little tidbits of, of perhaps perspective there. And there is, I would say, um, there's room for diversity of thought here as to how we try to explain all of this and how we relate to God in that way. Thank you very much, Dennis. That is, um, I'm learning a lot this evening. <laughs> Thank you. You've you've got a, a few sermon ideas too, I think. <clears throat> yes, yes. And Thanks. I've got them down. Thank you, Dr. Fortan. I appreciate that very much. And uh, he's going to be uh, teaching us on March 9th. And I hope it's going to, is it going to be with reference to the uh, book on Adventist history you've just written? Yes, uh, the seminar I'll do on March 9th will be on George Butler and some of the lessons we may learn from him. Uh, I'll, uh, I could speak for hours, but I'll, I'll limit it to uh, uh, just s some nuggets of uh, interest to everybody. Good. Yes, he's, a, he's quite an interesting character in our history. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, uh, Ed Reisnyder, join the conversation. Thank you. Uh, I want to pile on a little bit. Uh, <laughs> Beverly started this conversation, I think, and then Steve Siciliano and Dennis Fortan jumped on. Um. I feel like we're stuck in a paradigm that's uh, between two and 3,000 years old. Um, I've often wondered in recent days, if I closed my Bible and put it in a safe and didn't look at it for the next five years, how would I go about discovering God? Um, what would my sources be? I'm still stumbling around for an answer to that question. Um, but we love specific facts, dates, timelines, so forth. And we like to be very specific about God and heaven when, in fact, we know very little. 
All we know is imagery from two to 3,000 years old. And uh, how do we how do we get Christianity into the 21st century um, with our imagery and our understandings? Uh, I'm a little dissatisfied, to be honest, with being stuck at 2,000 years ago. Or if you're a strong believer in Ellen White at 150 years ago. Um, Whenever I look at the photographs from the Webb telescope, I think that uh, the old book titled Your God is Too Small is certainly applicable. And um, I find my mind drifting toward some form of mysticism, which is a word we really don't like. Um, but I looked up the definition of mysticism, and it talks about having a spiritual meaning or reality that is neither apparent to the senses nor obvious to the intelligence. Not apparent to the senses or obvious to the intelligence, yet has spiritual meaning. And I got to think that kind of applies to God. Uh, we can't sense or figure out God. Uh, so it, by definition, almost has to be something mystical. And I wonder if we're content to be in that position. Uh, so I guess that's a question. Can we be in that position, just accept that it's mystical and not try to go beyond what's available to us? Well, there are more questions tonight than I feel I can uh, I can really answer. Uh, when uh, when you're talking about this this book by by Phillips, I think uh, your God is too small. That certainly uh, strikes a chord with me. And uh, when you use the word mysticism, uh, maybe we could introduce the word spirituality uh, in order to express what you're getting at. Uh, there is more uh, to religion than a doctrinal understanding of God. It goes so much further. And that needs a different kind of mindset. And so, uh, and yes, we we must do, to some extent at least, with that what is given to us in the Bible. But uh, if we uh, if we can use, and I'm borrowing again from uh, Dr. Turner, if we can use our imagination. And, and I think we are entitled to use our imagination. That's what the Bible writers did when they used all these various pictures and metaphors and so on uh, from their day and age that they were familiar with. Uh, we, uh, we can build on that. And uh, some of these ancient metaphors still work for us. Some don't. And some new ones may have to do. But... Yes, I would. I would uh, myself uh, uh, stress the spiritual element, the worship element in our religion, uh, the emotional element also, uh, uh, not in in the place of, but certainly as a major component uh, to. Uh, uh, besides the doctrinal understanding of 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 our religion, thank you. Good question, uh, Ed. Uh, I'm going to uh, ask you to unmute. Are you are you there, Ed? Okay. Ed's not getting the unmute message, so I'm going to go to Kenneth. 
and uh, Ed will will pick up Ed afterwards. Kenneth, did you unmute? There you go. Thank you. I, am, I just uh, was thinking as the presentation was being made of the contrast of the Lord's Prayer with a uh, with the Jewish view that you cannot um, even say the name of God, and you're calling him Abba. Um, I was wondering if how that fits in with this, and uh, to the person who spoke just a moment ago, um, Ellen White warned that we, in the Great Controversy, often that um, movements st uh, stop where their founders when their founders died, they can quit moving on from there. And your reference to 1915, the death of Ellen White is apropos because we're having to make some choices if uh, we can only go as far as she went or if we can think um, and, and see the Bible beyond that. So, but the, the thing that really struck me was here's a group of people who say you can't, you can't um, even say the name of God out loud. And, and now Jesus is, just says, Abba our father you know yeah that's a that's a good question kenneth I mean, right there do you do you know was is judaism by its nature more oriented to the uh transcendence of god than christianity was did, did christianity sort of form a hinge there where suddenly we we became uh, a sense of more familiarity with god as opposed to to judaism I don't feel that uh, that I'm qualified to uh, really answer that question, but I think that uh, what has just been said is that you're also talking about two different elements when addressing God, uh, and there is a sense of of uh, reference or. Uh, being careful not to use the name of the Lord in vain. That is one aspect, but it's combined with the other one, and that is that we can use God, uh, uh, we, we, we can address him with very intimate terms. And naming someone, and again someone, uh, is a way of acknowledging a relationship, a tie, a bond. Uh, and so, again, there are these two elements that I feel need to be in balance. On the one hand, as I said earlier, God is not our buddy. Uh, he is, uh, he, he must be treated with reverence and awe because he is the creator. He is the Lord of the universe. But at the same time, uh, I can get close to him. I can talk to him. I can call upon him, ask him to, and he is close to me. Now, what all these words means, one again, once again, they are human words. But these two elements of this uh, distance and this nearness, that is what makes him God. You say God isn't our buddy, but isn't there a sense in Christianity that Jesus is our buddy? He walks with me and he talks with me. He tells me yep. I'm alone. Yeah. And the joy That's we true, share as we carry there also, that another has ever known. But also there, he is our Lord. Well, certainly in Revelation, he, he comes forth with a sword coming out of his mouth. Yeah. Mounted on a white horse, he, he becomes very much... The Lord and and uh, Paul Paul acknowledges that same thing. You know, it, a, a, above all principalities and powers, yeah. uh, there's Jesus. Yeah. Jesus becomes uh, a, a very, uh, in that case, a, a very martial, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and very uh, military figure. Yeah, it's good that we have other images also. Hey, you're, you're right. Very good point. Uh, Ed, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, this. Thank you for raising this important discussion. 
of course, uh, the whole gender thing is, um, has been an issue for a long time, according to the uh, Church of England. Last uh, spring, they set up a, an official process to neutralize throughout their church um, use of gender and try to make it neutral. And, of course, you have the, according to the reporting, you have the conservatives uh, who want to keep things the way they are and and you can't uh, view God in, in a feminine way because uh, that's not really who God is. And, and, of course, you have the other side who want to neutralize it. And um, so while you were doing your presentation, I thought of uh, Mark twelve twenty five, where Jesus talks about when uh, people are raised from the dead, they will not marry or get married. The whole marriage business is out the window. And they will be as angels. And angels are viewed as neutral, gender neutral, usually. And so in heaven, uh, there is no gender. If you if you use that simple uh, argument, I suppose. And yet, uh, God created male and female. So it, it kind of raises the question, um, you know, God could foresee that this would be a problem. So my question is, do you think any church or any Christian group or whatever can ever come to terms with this whole gender issue? Well, to some, it will be a great relief that there will be no more marriage in heaven. Uh, to some, it's a disappointment. Um, we have two genders, male, female. Well, in today's world, we often hear that we have many different genders rather than just male and female. So maybe there is a solution there for uh, for this, uh, this particular topic. Uh, but again... What we said earlier about heaven, uh, there needs to be some continuity, uh, but there's also going to be uh, a lot of discontinuity. We don't know what kind of bodies we will have. Uh, it seems that there is a concreteness to the resurrection body of Christ, and that we have statements that we will be like Christ, so it would think that that somehow there is there is uh, uh, some physicality about what we will be, but it's going to be so different from what we know now, and uh, whether we know now, marriage is one of the most intimate forms of togetherness. Uh, will there be even more superb uh, forms of being together, of relationships? It's all something that we must, uh, I think, we, we must just leave and, uh, and, and just expect that whatever there is going to be, it will be worthwhile, more than worthwhile. Uh, so... And yes, is any church anytime soon going to uh, solve the gender issue? I don't know which church it might succeed. Maybe there are some churches, uh, but uh, our, de our denomination has still a few other things that needs also to be solved. And I hope actually that uh, they will uh, they will be solved before we can uh, finally solve the gender issue. Very good. Thank you, Vince. And thank you for joining the conversation. And uh, I mean, um, Ed, rather. Uh, Vince is next. Uh, did I did I unmute you, Vince? Try it again. I may have muted you wrongly there. You know, something uh, while I wait for There you go, Vince. There you go. go. Yes. Go uh, Dr. Brunzo, I always really appreciate 
uh, your presentations and you touched just a few minutes ago sort of on where I was going to go with the question. And uh, it's, it's a little bit vague because until today, I hadn't really thought about it again. But sometime in the last year or two, uh, I was I was, was forwarded a sermon from a strain of Adventism that uh, was talking about, uh, as you were just discussing, Jesus in the new earth. And perhaps, I'm guessing it's from Ellen White, but uh, that the physical or somehow some representation of the nail prints and the side and all that would be permanent. And the sermon, I thought, went even further. It made it sound like his sacrifice was so great that he would be somewhat impaired as opposed to returning to a total divine state. And and I was curious, did Ellen White even suggest something like that? Are you aware of any statements like that? I'm assuming that that's where it came from. That's that's sort of the gist of my question. Well, I'm not aware of such a statement from Ellen White, but I know that, you know, you can almost prove anything from uh, some statements by, by Mrs. White. And it seems to me that anyway in her during her lifetime uh, she developed also in her view of the hereafter uh, some of the uh, things that she describes for instance in her early writings uh, they are very much more concrete than uh, some of the things that she uh, talks about uh, later in life when she talks about about heaven so uh and and that is uh, something that that i appreciate more and more that in fact uh ellen white went through uh the same kind of developments that many of us have gone through and that we have changed our mind and that we have uh adapted some of the views that we had earlier in life to something that is quite different even though we do not claim to have the prophetic gift uh, that is something that we experience too i look at heaven a lot more a lot less materialistic than i used to do uh, in my younger years Our friend uh, Alden Thompson has written quite often about um, how Ellen, the, the early Ellen White was, was quite different in her understanding of grace and acceptance of people than the later Ellen White. Um, I think part of our problem with Ellen White is that we tend to interpret any, or to grab any piece from any part of her life and treat it the same way. And I don't think that's quite fair to her. Uh, Marvin, you've got the last word. I just have found this discussion very enlightening, and I appreciate Dr. Brunsma whenever he presents. But I just want to make one comment. Back in 1952, when I was a student at Walla Walla, um, I got a job playing for the Christian Science Service at the Washington State Penitentiary every Sunday. And uh, one thing has gone on with me from that service. Uh, you know, Christian science arose about the time that our church arose, and you have... Mary Baker Eddy, mm -hmm. and the first time I heard this, our Father, Mother, God was there, and I have thought about that for all of these years, and uh, I thought, well, they've solved the the gender issue there. Just a comment. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd like to uh, to thank uh, 
all of you who have participated in this discussion, I have felt that that it has been very enlightening uh, also for, for myself. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, next week, uh, Dr. Horace Alexander from Southern California. Uh, he is going to be talking, uh, he's going to be unpacking the concept of Samson. And if I remember, if I uh, understood you correctly, Horace, you're going to be talking about it uh, with a little bit of reference to some of the places we're hearing mentioned in uh, the current Middle East crisis. So that should be interesting. Uh, thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody. God bless you. We'll see you next week.